So welcome. Um, just to help me out a little bit, um, how many folks are dairy or dairy related in the audience? Okay, good. So, a um, bit of my background, I came to WSU in 1984, so almost 31 years ago now, um, mainly uh, working as a nutritionist, so I worked a lot on the front end of the cow, but about 15 years ago got more involved on the other end of the cow, so doing a lot of uh, nutrient management kind of work. So. Uh, we still do feeding work, but still doing a lot with uh, the manure and the cows. So, those are the of you that are dairy related. A couple numbers to remember um, to give this some economic context today. So, um, remember about three hundred dollars per cow. Now, so how many uh, folks in the room have about five hundred cows? Three hundred. Okay. So, if you have three hundred, uh, that initial manure coming out of the cow. Is valued at about ninety thousand dollars. If you got five hundred cows, that initial manure coming out of the cow, from a nutrient standpoint, is about one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay. So with that as a backdrop, we've got uh, material here that's uh, certainly got some economic value, and I think that's important to consider as, as uh, we go through the presentations today. So let's see if I got this. Okay. So uh, Andy Berry, who was on the first slide, um, is done a lot of work for the last 20 years on compost and I've worked with Andy a bit he wasn't able to be here today so I'm kind of filling in for him a little bit so many of these slides are Andy's so uh, keep that in mind today so why do we care about uh, manure or what's called PAN plant available nitrogen the nitrogen is available in the manure uh, obviously fertilizer costs so as I mentioned if you got anywhere from 300 to 500 cows you got somewhere between 90 and 150 thousand dollars of fertilizer or nutrients there in that initial manure. Um, increasingly, we're seeing um, organic farming and or the National Organic Program um, and growth in that. Uh, and as a result of that, there's some standards that we'll talk about a little bit later. There's always environmental concerns. Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of uh, the issues with regard to the nitrates in groundwater in eastern Washington and the ongoing concern in Whatcom County. Um, Precision manure uh, application equipment um, is increasingly becoming available. So, again, having an idea how much of the nitrogen is available in that manure for the plant is, is critical. Um, Leaf and Aaron already talked about equip programs, and some of these uh, programs can support uh, many of the aspects of manure management. Then, the other piece that we're beginning to understand a bit more about is by better understanding how to best use nitrogen and, and not get losses of that to the atmosphere and get the, the, the crop use of that nitrogen, we can uh, reduce phosphorus buildup in our soils. So um, let's go to this nitrogen cycle. Uh, when I first started working on this about 20 years ago, it gave me an instant headache, so I'll appreciate if, 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 you, if that same thing happens to you. But let's start with the cow. Um, most of the nitrogen that comes out of the cow is in an organic form. <clears throat> so we have organic nitrogen. Uh, the microbes that are there in the, um, in, in the, in the manure plus um, urease activity, uh, an enzyme that breaks down urea, begins to convert that over to ammonia. And <clears throat> so when we apply the, the nitrogen to the, the crop, we've got both an organic form which is less readily available, and we've got the ammonia, which is fairly available to the crop. Now, the crop can take up ammonia, but it actually prefers nitrate. And so what happens when this organic is converted by the bacteria to ammonia, uh, this process is really rapid, and particularly this conversion. So it doesn't stay in this ammonium pool very long. It gets shifted over the, to the nitrate, so that's why when you get a soil test done, rarely do you look at the ammonia level in the soil because the ammonia it doesn't stay very long here. It, it goes very quickly over the nitrate. So once it's in the nitrate form, um, again, we, we prefer that it's going for crop uptake, but if we have a lot of nitrate left in the fall, and we'll talk a little bit about a test that you can do for that, um, two things can happen. If you have really wet soils, um, you can get in, in a lot of uh, uh, rain in the fall, like we typically do, you can have leaching loss to groundwater which is uh, then there's some of that money disappearing. Um, or the other thing that can happen in really wet saturated soils, tend to be swampy soils, is we can get uh, nitrogen gas uh, going off the atmosphere or N2O gas going off the atmosphere. 
So um, again, a preferred thing is just to get as much of this coming around this part of the cycle, uh, getting into the crop, and minimal amounts going off uh, in the direction of these blue arrows. Okay, so we've got this uh, manure that we've applied from the cow and it's in the soil now. And so if we look at the pools of nitrogen that are in the soil, we have what we call an active, active soil nitrogen and that's that part where it's the ammonia and the nitrate which is readily uptake, uh, can be uptake by the crop. We've got some living uh, or dead crop residues there. So like with, uh, if you got corn crop, okay, so you're gonna have stocks and so forth left um, at the end of the season. So that would represent that. And then we have what's called the stable nitrogen pool. And this is actually uh, quite huge. This could be thousands of pounds per acre easily if you were to measure total nitrogen in the soil. But this total nitrogen, um, is slowly degraded, slowly made available, and only part of it's available any given year. So if we look at that on kind of this bar chart, <clears throat> so if you think about applying, um, let's say you had a grass crop and you're gonna apply about 400 pounds of total nitrogen this year for that grass crop. Um, about 200 pounds of that nitrogen would be available, and 200 pounds of it would stay in the soil that a little bit could be available the next year. Okay, so that's what happens when we go to the next year, we apply manure. So this would be if you never, if, the, if this was a field that had never had manure applied to it at all. The second year we apply that 400 pounds of manure. And so from last year, we get part of this available the second year. So now we've got two of these amounts and then we get into third year and a little bit of this from the first year is still available in the third year. And then we have some from the second year that's available and so on and so on. So you hear it said often that once you've got about five years of manure application for the crop yield, that you can pretty much count on, if it was 400 pounds per year, you're gonna get about 400 pounds of nitrogen available from the manure because you have all these little incremental pieces, okay? So it's just slowly becoming available. Um, so kind of slow withdrawals from the bank account. Okay. So the post-harvest soil nitrate sampling, or what oftentimes is called the fall soil nitrate harvesting, is um, to get an idea and a snapshot in time in the fall, how well the crop had done during the season to utilize all the nutrients that were applied during that, that season. So, and that certainly can be affected by rainfall, um, climate, temperatures, for instance. I think it was about four years ago, we had one of our coolest summers in, in 30 years. And that year, uh, we were doing some experiments in the Monroe area, and uh, the yields that we collected off grass fields that year were down by 25, 30%. So in the beginning of the summer, you plan for you know this 100% yield, and you put all this nitrogen on, and then you get a cool summer, and all that nitrogen isn't taken up, and so then it's still sitting there in the fall. That should show up in this test. So, um, so the test measures the amount of the plant available nitrogen, because it's a soil nitrate test, present in the surface one foot. And so the idea is that it's kind of a report card back to you on, on what happened during that season. Um, and it can identify some imbalances of the nitrogen supply uh, to the farm fields. So how do you sample? Um, we take uh, samples at zero to 12 inches, so it's that top foot. I take 15 to 30 subsamples, so 13 to 15 to 30 holes in the field, or what's called a management unit area. So the idea is, if let's say you've got five fields and they're the, basically the same soil type, you got the same crop, you could pool all those samples into one and call it a management unit area. But if you got you get a situation where you got distinctly different fields that are different crops or different soil types, then you should separate out and, and soil sample those differently. You want to do it as soon after the, the crop harvest as, as you can in the fall, and certainly before you get into the heavy rains. Because what you want to do is see how much nitrate is left. And if, if you wait until there's already been about five inches of rain, this stuff's already flushed. Um, and uh, so if, if you want to, to learn something from the, the, the soil sample, you really need to get it before that five inches of rain. Okay, so again, back to the issue of soil types. So if you have fine, fine textured soils, uh, loams, clay loams, and, and, and clays, 
you're going to want to get that sample prior to five inches of cumulative rainfall or about October 15th. And we looked at some weather records this last year, um, looking at back through, well, this last summer we looked at the records, but the data was from the last most recent 30 years. And it looks like this October 15th is still a pretty good date to shoot for um, um, in, the, in this area because we looked at some Buckley rainfall. Um, so I think you can still shoot for that on these uh, finer textured. When you get into sandy textured soils, uh, sand or loamy sand or sandy loam, um, you really probably want to try to get it by before about three inches of cumulative rainfall or a calendar date of about October 1. And again, these soils are not going to be able to hold that nitrate as well. So those are some calendar dates, and um, if you're following rainfall, you can get kind of a sense of, you know, that one, or excuse me, that three to five inches of rainfall. Okay, interpretation of the soil results that you get back, oftentimes they'll either come back in PPM or they'll come back in milligrams per kilogram. So, um, and then you get to deal with the issue of how dense that soil is, and usually, um, depending on how, how dense the soil is, you can use a factor somewhere between three and four. So a lot of times people use three and a half. Um, and so if you had 20 part per million came back on that soil test, you multiply that by three and a half, that's about 70 pounds of nitrogen that's available. Or uh, in the fall, if it's sitting there in the fall, that 70 pounds of nitrogen is probably gonna go over the winter and get flushed away. So, okay, interpretation of the results from a standpoint of corn silage. Um, if the number in the fall is less than 20 part per million, keep, keep business as usual. If you're beginning to see numbers between 20 and 45, you probably want to use what's called a pre-side dress nitrate test in the, in the uh, early summer when you're um, looking at your corn growth. So you get up to, I think it's about before the three leaf stage of the corn, you're going to want to be taking that soil test. And then um, depending on what kind of results you get on that test, then consider reducing uh, additional nitrogen uh, application at cornfield. If it's greater than 45 part per million in the fall, you definitely need to be looking at how much nitrogen you're applying to those fields and uh, stay away from any nitrogen application after August 1. For grasses, um, the number is about 15 part per million. Um, continue business as usual, 15 to 30. Again, try to get your applications earlier in the season and reduce applications by about 10 to 25 percent. If it's greater than 30 ppm, you're going to want to reduce your nitrogen applications again. Get them earlier in the season because what happens is, particularly in our area in western Washington, um, August tends to be pretty dry and so the soils shut down and they aren't making a lot of this organic nitrogen converted over to nitrate to get taken up by the crop. But as soon as we start getting September rains, the soil's still warm, we can begin kicking that biological cycle in. And all of a sudden, um, we can get lots of nitrate being produced in September, but, but it's cooled down enough, the grass isn't growing fast enough to take up all that nitrate. So again, getting your nitrogen on earlier in the season is gonna be a good thing. Okay, uh, Nicole said we we're gonna wait until later for, for questions as a group. So we'll ignore that slide. Okay, so I'm supposed to address a little bit of uh, the composting side. My guess is this will overlap a bit with the other speakers, but that's probably okay, because uh, we probably all need to hear it uh, a couple of times just for it to sink in. So composting, um, and, and this has got an ING on the end of it, so I think that's really important. And I was, when I was visiting with Amy about this the other day, there's a difference between composting and compost, okay? Compost is that finished product which meets standards. Composting is the process which could result in an end product that could be compost, but it doesn't necessarily mean just because you're composting that you're ending up with a product that's stable, that's met the temperature and time profile. So kind of keep that in mind. Is it an ING or is it just compost? Okay. So composting is the decomposition, so it's the breakdown of organic materials by aerobic microorganisms. So uh, key things, we need organic matter, we need aerobics, so we need air into it, and uh, preferred to do it under some controlled conditions. So here's some examples. This is uh, um, what used to be a, a, a feed bin, a pialop, um, and they're doing some stack composting there. And what they'll do is go in and turn this with a, a loader. This is some windrows where they'll go in and actually use a windrow turner. Um, so a, a bigger commercial operation here. Uh, and then this is another one um, where they, what they've done is just created a stack 
um, and uh, surrounded it by uh, obviously the, the platforms here. Um, so one of the things that I have heard through the years is, is it, so, so some of the initial materials you're going to use for compost is your, your large particle solids that come out of your manure. And so you'll hear it said that the separators will solve your nutrient management problem. You put in a separator and all these nutrients are going to go to the pile and then you got those that you can ship off farm. Uh, that's not the truth. Um, that's not a, a true statement and so any company that tells you they're going to solve your problems just by separating out the manure solids uh, isn't telling the truth. So let's look at some real numbers um, that have been published or numbers that we've gathered with some, some data uh, here in the state. So on this axis, this is the amount of solids removal. Um, and these are from uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven experiments that were done around the United States. And so what we're doing is we're saying how much solids could be removed with these different systems. And then in those solids that are removed, these large particle solids, how much nitrogen got removed, okay? So typically our separators are performing somewhere down in here in this range, 20 to 30% solids removal. Uh, but as you go up and you can remove more and more solids, you can get more and more nitrogen removal. But even up here at like say 70%, you're still only getting what? 30% of the nitrogen removed, okay? So a lot of that nitrogen is still very soluble, stays with the liquid, goes to the lagoon, all right? So anybody that tells you they're gonna remove all of your nitrogen when you remove the solids is, again, not telling the, the real story. So let's look at phosphorus removal. Again, here on this x-axis, solids, same set of experiments. Get up here around 70%, really high solids removal. Again, somewhere around a little over 30% phosphorus removal. So, um, so we've got to keep that in mind that we do remove some into the solids, but we don't remove all of it. So a few years ago, we had a chance to look at two different types of separators. One was an ICE. It's a screw-type separator, and the other was these DT360s, which were produced up in Whatcom County. So you looked at them. So the, uh, lots of numbers here on the table, but what I want to show you, what I want to highlight is the ones in yellow. So the ICE um, screw press separator, it'll pull out about 25% of the solids. 13% of the nitrogen, and 21% of the phosphorus. The DT360s, um, somewhere between 13 and 20% of the solids, so less than the screw press. Somewhere between four and 6% of the nitrogen, much less than the 13 on the ice, and then um, somewhere be around 10% of the phosphorus, so about half of what came out with the other separator. So these are, these are Washington numbers from a, a Washington dairy. Okay, so, some examples of what isn't composting. Uh, these are some slides Andy took. Um, pretty messy pile here. Lots of stuff just stacked. Um, not sure what they got here, but it's kind of an icky mess. So, um, so what can you compost? Uh, obviously, animal manure, stray uh, hay, vegetable matter, yard debris, wood shavings, chips, newspaper, animal mortalities, and fish processing waves. So here's uh, pictures of a number of those. So what happens during the compost process? We're taking organic matter, minerals, water, and microorganisms in this compost pile, and we want to end up with organic matter. But what happens is during the process, we'll lose at least half that stack, okay? So a lot of it's going off as CO2, but there's a lot of nitrogen that's going off as well. So during the composting process, what we want to do is get uh, a temperature up here above 140, and you need to have that for a period of days. Um, this is done by the microbes, and the microbes need water. So if we have a pile that's too wet or too dry, we don't get as good a, a microbial action, so we want it to stay somewhere between 40 and 65 percent uh, moisture. Um, again, you can see this is really wet. Um, so what happens is if, if it's too dry, the microbes can't move around and get at the nutrients. If it's too wet, you can't get enough oxygen in there. They need oxygen. So that's why you need kind of that sweet spot of 40 to 65. Um, how much time? Two minutes? Yep. Three, oh, three, three. minutes, okay. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about producing compost for organic crop production. Um, there are standards that are out on a national basis and, and really the context of these next few slides are if, if I'm gonna grow vegetable crops 
and, or fruit crops, can I apply compost or can I apply manure? And how long before I harvest a crop can I apply it? Okay? So um, that's really the context of the next few slides. Just kind of keep that in mind. Is it compost or is it manure? And how long a time period between when I harvest it can I apply it uh, to the crop? So the National Organic Standards were developed in October 2002. Um, they replaced the Washington Organic Certification Rules um, and certification is still handled by WSDA. Um, if you have compost um, and the compost does not contain animal manure, these particular rules I'm talking about don't apply. So raw manure um, is okay to use if the crop is not for human consumption, so for cows, all right? So that's an easy one. If um, you incorporate the manure 120 days before harvest and the edible uh, crop is in direct contact with the soil. So um, again, what you want to do is, is, is keep out this like, so that's what, four months? So you got to apply in the fall and you got all this rain during the winter. So it seems counterintuitive, but yet from a safety standpoint, because of bacteria in, in the manures, we have to have this 120 days. If it's incorporated into the soil, you can do it about 90 days before harvest. Um, if it's an edible that's in, uh, not in direct contact with soil or soil microbes. So um, why do we wait this 190 to 120 days? Um, well, again, things like uh, uh, apples, corn, berries, and wheat um, would be okay if you use manure. But if you're going to have soils like potato, or excuse me, crops like potatoes, radish, squash, lettuce, any of these row crops, you're going to need to try to stay beyond 120 days. So um, to be called compost, and this gets back to compost versus composting. The initial feedstock ratio is supposed to shoot for a target of somewhere between 25 to 40 uh, amount of carbon and about one on the, on the nitrogen. That's where you get the best kind of process. Um, there's a certain number of allowed feedstocks for that. Uh, you need to maintain records for documenting those requirements. And the big thing is meeting this temperature and time criteria. Um, so for static and aerated systems and uh, in vessels, you want to be between this 131 and 170 degrees for three days. For windrow method, they want it between 130 and 170 for 15 days. And you need to have a minimum of five turns. Here's some additional resources, and I understand from uh, talking to Nicole that these PowerPoints can be made available to you. They weren't printed off for today, but anybody just let me know, and, and we can get this material to you. So, and I think after the next two speakers, are going to be time for some questions. So, Great. thanks, Joe. Yep. So our next speaker is is Mason Guillen. He is the um, Correct me if I get this wrong, but the compost and outreach yeah. coordinator yeah. at um, here we go, WSU Extension in yeah. Snohomish. And um, what I've asked him to talk about a little bit about today, um, and this is a nice trans transition from Joe, is what are the the opportunities um, if you have a com if you have compost um, and you're trying to create those connections, or if you have manure and you're trying to create those connections with um, somebody that maybe needs those nutrients. Where are the opportunities um, around that, and then as well as other things he has um, going on right now in his program? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I guess uh, first off, uh, a little bit about me. I grew up in Cattle Ranch, Montana, and so you know, ranching and uh, working with cattle is something that's very near and dear to my heart. But first off, who's used compost or made compost on their farm? Excellent. All right. Well, good. Then we're going to be off to a good start here. So I'm going to go over a program that we, a very exciting program we have going up in uh, Snohomish County and uh, partially in King County. Uh, some of the research re results we have on the impacts that compost can have on crops, and um, you know what some farmers are looking for, at least in the Snohomish County, in their compost use. Um, some of the barriers that we've identified to them using compost, and then um, uh, at the end I'll talk about this best management practice guide that we have developed on how to use compost on the farm. So a little overview of our program. Uh, there is about 300,000 tons of food and yard waste from Seattle and Snohomish uh, counties per year processed in large-scale commercial composting facilities. Uh, these would be Lens, Cedar Grove, and Bailey Compost. And uh, as it stands right now, Cedar Grove is telling us that only about 5% of their compost is going to the agricultural market. 
I think this is a very uh, interesting to note when on the eastern side of the Cascades, about 95% of their compost is going to the agricultural market. And so the original purpose of our program was to try to figure out why and what we can do to get the farmers using more compost. That would be our goals. Evaluating, uh, we have several uh, goals on our uh, program. One be evaluating the effect of the compost on local farms, building soil quality, um, closing the loop on the food cycle. This is very important to us um, to keep that nutrients in our local systems instead of letting it go to the landfill where it you know, would be lost forever. Um, and we wanted to conduct research and so that we could uh, prove to everybody about how compost does impact the crops. Um, and then these are the Cedar Grove and Bailey and Lands Composting have all been donating massive amounts of compost to us. So, what kind of uh, research trial results have we had? Well, we've had some pretty exciting ones. At Carlton Farms, we saw a 35% increase in uh, cucumber yield. On the Williams uh, Farms, we saw a 19 increase in their beet seed yield. At Dale Haggerty, we saw a 21% increase in the organic beans. And I've got all this uh, information on a handout and out in the back. So what, uh, one of the ways we've been able to work with farmers and to try to get them the opportunity to even see compost is to just give them compost for free. And what we do is we ask them to do a side-by-side -side trial of the same crop, same field, put compost in one area and com no compost in the other so they can see firsthand the benefits of compost on their fields. And we've seen some pretty, pretty amazing things. This is a former co-worker of mine, Hallie Harness, standing on one of those brilliant uh, piles of compost and here's some compost down low um, being used on some blueberries. So um, between 2011 and 2015, we've uh, been able to distribute over 4,500 total tons of compost and been working with 73 different farmers in Snohomish and King Counties. So uh, what are we asking for the compost quality? This is something that we had to kind of learn as we went along. One, uh, we had to make sure that the compost is screened to a half inch. Um, this is pretty important because the compost that we're using is coming from the food and yard waste from the city of Seattle mostly. Um, and so there's contamination in it and form of plastic and, and other things. And so uh, first we weren't having them double screen their compost and now we are and that's greatly improved the quality of the compost. Uh, we would like a 50% moisture content in the compost that we're providing. Uh, we also like a C to N ratio of uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio of about 20. Um, or lower. Um, we found that much higher than 20 or even 25 is kind of the max. It kind of starts to tie up that of plants available nitrogen in that first year and farmers aren't able to see the, uh, the same results. Uh, we do like a pH of 6 to 8 and uh, what farmers are telling us... Yes sir? Um, do you have anything that's available in the pH below 6? Ooh. Not that I'm finding. It's uh, generally a pretty uh, stable pH at this point. Mm -hmm. um, if you, if you, you know, you show the blueberries and blueberries need it below six. They certainly do. Yep. Um, there is a lens compost unit right now is making specialty blends just for blueberries and other crops. And that's something that they're uh, researching and uh, they can definitely work with you on that. They've got great scientists out there. Um, so, you know, mostly our farmers are asking for, you know, well-matured, not woody um, compost. They, of course, don't want any weed seeds or chemicals. This is something that we definitely worry about coming from people's food and yard waste bins. Um, however, because the process is getting up to over 150 degrees and meeting those PFRP requirements, uh, there are no weed seeds and it's able to um, destroy most of those chemicals. Um, as that pH, of that neutral pH, um, minimal heavy metals, we do test for those things. And then little to no plastic contaminations and with double screening to get rid of that. Uh, and I think it's very important to note that uh, the compost companies of Cedar Grove and Lens have spent uh, millions of dollars in purchasing equipment to particularly remove that contamination, um, and partially as a result of our program, and they're able to produce a much higher quality product now because of it. That's what we don't want. And this is what we were originally finding. These, uh, these plastic forks over here, um, nobody wants that in their field. And so uh, we, we said, no, that is not acceptable. Let's not do that. So uh, he, uh, previous speaker just kind of spoke about this, but um, 
this is kind of, you know, to be organic, um, you know, can't have the bioplastics. This is uh, one thing that we're contending with in the Seattle um, area in particular, because you are allowed to put compostable plastics into your compost bin, um, which prevents it from being certified organic. Uh, if it's just a yard waste compost and doesn't have any of these other inputs into it, um, it can be if it follows, if it meets the other requirements. Um, and uh, so they are making separate batches for like a self haul where it's just the yard waste coming from landscapers or whatever, then we do have organic um, loads. And we have some of our farmers that are requesting pure organic compost. Um, so, yeah. So what are some of the challenges? And as farmers, hopefully you've uh, recognized some of these yourself. But uh, we've done several surveys and been working with them a lot. And go figure, number one problem is cost. Uh, it's actually, partially, it's kind of expensive amendment. And uh, it's something that we've been working on uh, developing ways to address that cost. Um, yeah. Uh, another thing that adds to that cost is the spreading, time and equipment. Uh, what we found is that a lot of the farmers up in the Snohomish areas don't necessarily have the equipment to spread the compost. And the result is they're putting it out with, there with the front end loader and spending hours and hours to spread it. Um, and then plastic contamination. So uh, plastic contamination is still an issue and about 25% of our farmers are mentioning that they are still finding plastic in their compost. And then of course compost delivery. Uh, we ran into an issue last year where everybody wanted compost at the same time and then it rained and then they couldn't get it to their fields out there and so the compost was unable to get there in a timely manner. Um, and so that's another issue that we're working on dealing with. and. Uh, it's all just a logistics thing, and this year what we're doing is we're asking farmers to take it as early as they can. Uh, if we can drive on their fields, or you know they have a safe spot to put it, we'll get it out there as soon as we can to them. And then lack of information. I was personally surprised at how few people actually knew about compost or how to use it. Um, and uh, so by by um, uh, you know disseminating this information, we we're able to really. Uh, get more people interested in it. That's that narrow weather window as I was talking about. So the compost price, 50% of those farmers are saying that the compost price is the biggest barrier to using it. And this is particularly relevant when you're looking at compost at like 20 bucks a yard generally. Um, and to put it on uh, you know, 15 tons an acre, you're looking at about 1,000 bucks an acre for compost as an amendment. Uh, this, we have to show that compost can be used to replace other things. And that's something that our research has been working on, on, on providing. Most farmers are telling us they're willing to pay $10, $15 a yard. So as a farmer producing compost, you can think that you have that manure that's worth something, but if you turn it into compost, it might be worth something else on other people's farms as well. There's a spreading, uh, 20 hours a week. Uh, lots of farmers are saying that uh, it's still hard for them to spread it. And uh, you can rent a small spreader from Snohomish and King County Conservation Districts. Um, they're pretty small. They only do like one or two yards uh, at a time, and this can also be time consuming for some of the farmers. And we are exploring opportunities for grants and other things to get kind of larger spreaders. In particular, we're looking for a large row spreader that can put the compost in a very specific row um, to really maximize the use of it. Um, yep, broadcast spreaders. Uh, this is the way a lot of our farmers are doing it right now. And I feel so bad for their backs. They, they work very hard. Um, and this is an example of the row mulching spreader that we're hoping to try to snag up as a part of our program. So we've learned a lot. Uh, composter or farmers are definitely seeking the reliable, high source or high quality sources of the organic matter. Um, and we've also been creating a lot of opportunities for those farmers and composters to interact and trying to foster this uh, development of this market. Um, compost price is variable. We've seen it vary throughout the year. Um, there's kind of an off season for compost. Um, and that would be like in August through September, you know, or October. Um, however, um, you know, that's something that we're working on and we did some off season deliveries this year. Um, and we're trying to make sure that it's a really high quality 
um, compost that we're providing them. Uh, we don't want them to think of it as a waste product that people are just throwing their garbage into. We need to think of this as a resource that we're utilizing that's helping build the topsoil and saving water and returning nutrients back to the land where it belongs. So, um, what else did we learn? Well, there can't be any chemicals or weed seeds in there. there um, uh, we are having an interesting uh, dilemma between cubic yards and tons, and farmers <laughs> wondering, like, well, how much am I actually getting if I had paid yards, but, yeah, but, it, but I got the invoice in tons, so we've been working out those little things as well. And getting that delivery ticket is key to that. Um, we, uh, there's compost plants, there's something that Lens is working on and developing, you know, stuff that's inoculated. Um, there's a lot of potential in there, I think. And this is the cubic yard idea. And we're still looking for equipment services to be rented and off season compost delivery. So yeah, real quick, we've got a lot of partners in this uh, in this group, and uh, we're very thankful for everybody's help in creating this. And we look forward to continuing to bring more compost to farmers in some of the Green counties. Thank you, Mason. That's really informative. Um, so our next uh, speaker today is Rick Ryan Lasoder. He's from um, King County's livestock program, probably. Many of you have interacted with Rick at some point. Um, he is going to speak to the um, regulatory requirements around compost. Um, and I think this is interesting, especially as we have uh, many, not many, but a few farmers that have entered this, um, this realm of selling compost um, to other farms. And so if you are interested in doing that, you know, how do you do that in a legal way? Rick is going to speak to that. Hey, thanks, Rick. All right, thanks, Aaron. Yeah, so um, I know I get to crap on the trade, but sorry, it's a compost and manure joke. Uh, Aaron, I'm going to have you hand out the spreadsheet or the uh, the flow chart yep. and whatever. So um, I work for the King County Agriculture Program, and I, I wear a tiny regulatory hat that's related to the brand, brown handout, which is called our Livestock Management Ordinance. The dairy folks in the audience can breathe a sigh of relief because you guys are exempt from our Livestock Ordinance. Those of you that are not dairies will be subject to this ordinance. And, and for those of you that we've worked with before, you'll be familiar with the stuff in there. It sets our livestock densities for the non-dairy operations. Uh, it talks about setbacks from streams and wetlands. It talks about um, some of the setbacks from manure management, those types of things. So I'm going to talk first about this document real quick, which I know the most about. And then we'll talk about the other part that I know a little bit, well, quite a bit less about, but try to walk you through that. So um, I think the most important uh, thing that comes up with regard to um, manure management are the setbacks for manure storage. And I'm just going to refer to the term as manure storage as opposed to compost bins. We'll just view it as kind of all one and the same. But our King County zoning code does require that manure storage facilities be at least 35 feet from a property boundary. Um, it comes up a lot in code, uh, code enforcement cases. Um, so that's the first thing to think about. And then our livestock ordinance does require that uh, your manure storage areas um, be at least 100 feet back from open water, and that any surface water on the site be directed away from those, those uh, manure storage areas. And uh, the reasons for that are check water quality, number one, but number two, also to make sure those nutrients stay in the manure or the compost that we're working on so that it can actually go back out into a field and do some good as opposed to ending up somewhere and doing some bad. So um, I am happy to answer questions because this is the, the one small regulatory hat that I do wear. Um, the second part, the question came up, and I think recently the Conservation District uh, sent some information out to, to the dairies in particular about composting. So I think it's interesting because I was talking to Aaron's colleague, Josh Monahan, and he and I have been working together for many years on some of these issues. And, um, the State Department of Ecology has the authority to draft what we call our solid waste handling guidelines. And they're not guidelines, they're actually rules and regulations. But the rules and regulations around compost in Washington State are geared towards sort of protecting the name of compost and making sure that there's a product out there that's a quality product. And so if you use the term composting or you use the term compost, it puts you into more of a regulatory realm. So I guess the first thing to think about is are you in a situation where you don't need to use that terminology? And if you don't, and it's not a big part of your marketing thing, it's probably going to make life easier for you. 
Um, so we have this spreadsheet, this colorful spreadsheet. I'm just going to point out this is a draft document. It's more of a working document to just kind of help us figure out where we might sit. Ideally, you want to try to figure out how to end up in one of those green ovals, if possible. And ideally, you want to end up in the green ovals that are within the big red oval, because that requires no reporting to our King County Health Department, which is our local regulator that handles composting uh, facilities. So um, I'll just kind of walk through that. Um, and I do understand that we're sort of set up to take questions after, but if, if a term or something doesn't make sense at this point, please raise your hand and we'll try to answer it. So the first thing, if you look at the purple diamond up in the upper portion, this is our egg waste being composted on site. And so if we want to use the term composting for a solid product that we want to call compost, we have to say yes and go to the right of that chart. And we can get to the green boxes over there, but or the green ovals, but if we end up in the gold, gold ovals or some of the diamonds, the regulatory environment is tougher. So we want to try to not end up in those if we don't have to. Um, so I think the easiest thing is let's just look at the, the red oval, start there. So we don't want to use the term compost, we're just going to make aged manure, we're just going to say, hey, we're just processing this material to change the nutrient composition a little bit, I'm not going to brand it as compost or mark it as compost. So we're saying that we're not composting on site, even though we're using composting uh, terms or, or, you know, process. So we'd say no, we go down and we say, is, uh, and I guess the other thing is the term egg waste. Agricultural waste are a pretty narrow definition. I'm guessing that the majority of what most of you would be processing or handling would fit into that category. Animal manures, crop residues, wood stall waste, those types of things would fit into egg waste. If you are bringing in food waste or yard waste, guess what? You end up on the other side of the chart and you have to go through different regulatory hurdles for that. And, and, and there are some good reasons. Food waste rots quickly and it smells really bad. And if any of you live near the uh, large composting facility in Maple Valley, even though they've spent millions of dollars on odor control, I've been in the valley at times and like, wow, this is really an interesting, exciting smell. <laughs> so there, there are some, there are some reasons why some of these things are in place. And if you think about, like, even in the city of Seattle, I can put a lot of things in my uh, food and yard waste bin to go to composting at Cedar Grove. What I choose to do is I keep it in the freezer until the day before pickup and then I put it in the waste bin because, you know, on a 90 degree day that stuff will turn pretty quickly. So, um, so let's just say we're doing agriculture waste. I'm guessing some of you in here, I know a few of you uh, have horses or alpacas or llamas, um, even for the dairy facilities. If you're just composting your separated solids and maybe you're bringing in some used, uh, you know, horse bedding that you've run through your facility and is now part of that or you're using it as a bulking agent, you're going to fit under there, we're going to follow that chart, we're going to say, is egg manure and crop waste stockpiled on site and then transported off site? If the answer is no, meaning we're not stockpiling a whole bunch of it and we're not taking it off site to land that we do not own or lease, we would fit in that left green box. And what you want to look for, the easiest thing is if it says no notification, reporting, or testing required, that is what we call categorically exempt. And you, as much as possible, want to be categorically exempt because there's no cost with it. The only thing is that our local health jurisdiction does have the right to come onto the site with advance notification to look at it. Now, I'll honestly tell you there's only a couple of staff. They would prefer not have to go out and look at these operations. And I think they would actually, frankly, be overwhelmed by the number of you that are doing some type of composting or processing. Uh, but just be aware. If they wanted to or a complaint came in, they could come on, you know, with advanced notification, could come on site and take a quick look at what you're doing. Generally, if you're working with the local conservation district on your uh, waste handling processes, you're generally going to be fine because you're going to be addressing leachate. You're going to be, you know, making sure your carbon to nitrogen, not carbon to nitrogen ratio is appropriate in those types of things. So that's kind of the easiest way to go. Now, if you are taking stuff off site or selling it, you would go into the box down below. Another categorically exempt one, but this is one that if you look at it, it says 50% of the product that you're producing must be used within a year. So if you have a facility where you have a giant pile and you're not turning over 50% of that pile every year, guess what? We're going to end up over on the other side of this. And the idea here is trying to make sure that we are not building these giant piles that are creating water quality concerns somewhere down the road. Um, I'm going to guess that the vast majority of you in the room, even the dairies, if you are using composting techniques, hopefully you fit into that, that red oval. Um, if not, we can go to the other side. 
Now, um, there is another categorical exemption for folks that want to bring yard waste and, and other feedstocks, but it's less than 25 cubic yards. Not going to apply, I, I don't think, to any of the dairies. Maybe a couple of you that are, you know, one or two horses or something, maybe you would fit into that category. Um, bottom line, uh, I think to give you some, um, the other thing that's really interesting, I use the term categorically exempt. That means you don't need to notify our health department of what you're doing, no annual reporting, no testing, no cost. We have another category, which is called conditionally exempt. And there's actually a form that you fill out if you end up in the categorically, in, or excuse me, the conditionally exempt. And even though you, there's the term exempt, it doesn't mean that you don't apply for anything. You still have to apply for the cate, or, uh, excuse me, the conditional exemption. And there is an $800 review cost for that exemption. So once again, if you can avoid that, let's figure out how to avoid that. Um, the other part, if you're interested in using the compost name and branding your product as being composted and meeting the standards, it's pretty expensive. The permit is $5,500 a year, plus review <coughs> fees on top of that. So once again, let's follow the easiest road if we can. Now for some of you, if you've got a big operation and you found out a creative way to make money with your composting operation and you want to go through the permitting process, maybe that's part of your business model. But I'm just trying to lay out sort of the three categories here. We have our categorically exempt, and if we can get to that one, that's the ideal way to go because there's a lot less regulation. Um, I, I honestly think most of you in the room would fit into that category, um, and if not, maybe with some minor tweaks you would. Then we have our conditionally exempt. It's $800. You've got to, to apply for the exemption in order to get it. Um, you'll do a site inspection, so on and so forth. And then if you want to use the term compost or composting, you've got to apply for the permit. It's expensive. Um, just for example, um, just to give you guys an example, um, the largest composter in the area pays $20,000 a year for their permit. Now they're handling hundreds of thousands of, of tons of material, but it's expensive. Um, and and I'm, I'm not here to defend the, the cost of the permitting or anything like that, but give you guys an idea of where you might fall. Um, I'm trying to think, Aaron, um, I mean that, that's kind of the framework. Um, I'm not going to touch on what it would take to get your permit and all of the things. I mean, they would look at your stormwater controls and whether or not you're, you know, collecting your leachate and do you have the appropriate size pad and how much materials on site and stuff like that. The, generally, the code is set up, or the solid waste handling guidelines are set up to try to figure out a way for folks to process this material and reuse it, but not store huge amounts of it on site and have water quality issues or odor issues. Um, and so, you know, you have to also think of it as neighbors. You know, if you were next door to somebody who was bringing in, you know, fish carcasses and, and putting it in, um, you know, the, if it's not going to look like that, that could be a mess. Uh, the other thing is, it gets a little dicier if you are um, composting mortalities. If you are using the material on site, you probably are going to be exempt. Um, but if you were selling the material and you're composting mortalities, then you're probably going to end up on the other side of the equation. Um, and that's something that your conservation district uh, planner could kind of work with you to figure out. Um, if you guys, and I don't have it right in front of me, it's in my briefcase, um, the person at the health department that provided this information, and it, who is actually the person that approves our conditional exemptions and our um, license permitting facilities, I'm happy to give you her name if you've got any questions. Um, you know, you could call anonymously if you had questions, or I'm sure that um, you can put together a list of questions with your farm planner, and, and they, they would be happy to relay those questions. Her name is Yolanda Pond, and I can get her phone number, and, and uh, we'll figure, or maybe I'll just grab it after I'm done and shout it out. You guys can write it down, and um, if you want to follow up with her. Erin, was there anything else in particular that was of interest? I don't think so. I mean, I think that the big distinction that I've heard around using the word compost is um, I would say aged manure. I think that's the yeah yeah it, it, yeah because uh, it, it's it, how somebody might interpret it. So just just so you know, there is a dairy facility that, um, with the information the conservation district sent out, I got this frantic call from one of the dairy producers, and she said, "Oh my goodness gracious, help me figure out what I'm supposed to do with the solid waste uh, permit." And I went, "Oh, gee, Christmas," and, and it started all these red flags for me when she asked that question. 
And so I, I did the research. I actually went to the website for their product. I scoured the website, and nowhere on their website did they use the term compost or composting. In fact, on their bags of material, it says, I don't know that I would have used the term raw, but they say 100% raw cow manure. So the term composting is not used. Now, in their description of what they're producing, they talk about you know, heating it up to a certain temperature and retaining it for so many days in the you know, processing vessel, which are composting techniques, but they don't use the term compost or composting. And so I looked at it, and in talking to Yolanda from the health department, she said, you know, if they're not stockpiling material and it is moving out on a really regular basis, they should be categorically exempt, and, and we agreed on that. So that was good news for that one. Now, um, other operations that are doing it differently, maybe that wouldn't fit. But I, that one I was interested in because uh, that dairy owner said, hey, we want to make sure we're doing it right. We've gone through other processes to certify our product organic. And so I went and I looked at the website to see and you know, so their uh, begging material as well as their website mentions nothing about the term compost. And so I think they're okay with what they're doing. Um, so do you want to open it to questions? Yeah, I have a question. So if we can have our... Um Three compost speakers come up. Um, and I, I want to apologize for not being super versed in this. Um, we had to do a change of speakers, and I think about three days ago, um, I agreed to participate, and I had to scramble to get the support from our health departments, and and um, so it it was nice to get the the flow chart to at least understand this. And I think most of you can fit into the good categories, and I think we'll be okay. But um, good information. So we like to take the opportunity. We have about um, 15 minutes for questions. We had a question first in the back there. Um, for Mason, <laughs> no guarantees on an answer. <laughs> Feather meal or blood meal? I guess it depends on what you're going for. Uh, I'm not really sure. What are you trying to grow? Uh, blueberry. I'd have mm -hmm. to get back to you on that one. I'm sorry. I don't know. That's on my head. Yeah, I use it. But I just... You use it? Yeah. Hey, you have a good result. only like fertilizers. No phosphorus, no potassium. You know, one thing one of our blueberry farmers is, has found is that when he puts the compost on, it's actually creating more weeds. <laughs> Feeds weeds it too on his blueberries, and so he's doing a layer of compost and then a layer of uh, sawdust uh, or you know wood chips on top to kind of help suppress the the weed growth, but still keep the nutrients there. And he's found great results with that. Okay, another question in the front here. Go ahead. Um, are there guidelines or plans on the size of the uh, age manure storage? There's three sections I saw. If you're working with the farm planner, and in your case, the folks that were working with you will help you on the design size okay. based on your animal numbers, <coughs> the months of storage any uh, bedding waste that you've got, those types of things. So you're, you're already plugged in on that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, sorry, we had a question in the back there. What's the pros and cons about the digester? Oh, the pros and cons. Um, I'll, I'll take a shot at that because I, I, I was, um, King County was one of the small partners in putting that project together. Um, once again, um, a digester is not a magic bullet for nutrients. One thing the digester does do is it makes some of the nutrients in a little more of a plant available form and perhaps a little easier to separate out on the other end. Um, an anaerobic digester will produce you know, some type of natural gas that you can use for power or natural gas or something like that. Um, unfortunately right now power prices are pretty low so it's not a huge market for, for power. Um, Joe, any other ideas on anaerobic digesters? Just a little more about context of the question. So we did quite a bit of work up in Monroe on nutrients, on pathogens, and a little bit about the economics. So, well, give me a little more context of your question. So, like the perfect, perfect blood and the grease and stuff like that. What, what more does that give, like, like protein wise and stuff? Okay. So, um, <coughs> yeah, in, in our state, um, with cheap electricity that we have, with the hydropower and a little bit of nuclear, but mostly hydro. Um, it's hard for the digesters to make enough gas and enough money as a standalone unit. So having extra feedstocks come in and therefore tipping fees. So bringing in those extra feedstocks brings you some money. And in some cases, it can bring as much money as you're making off the gas going to the generator to sell for electricity. Okay? So it's, it's a big part of the, the, you know, the business model. 
Um, from a nutrient standpoint, <clears throat> grease is not going to bring much in, but it's going to give you a lot of gas. But you got to be careful about how much, because you can knock that, the, the bugs out really bad if, you, if you've got too much fat coming in. Um, there's uh, people have done it, people have done it in the state, so you've got to be careful about that. On the blood side, blood brings in a lot of nitrogen, uh, but also brings in a lot of phosphorus. So, um, so you can bring some nutrients in. So if, if for instance, if your farm's already kind of pushing the envelope on nitrogen, and now you're bringing in feedstocks to a digester that's got a lot of nitrogen in it, you know, you, it could be a negative. Um, so I do know from working with it that um, uh, the digestate coming out of the digester uh, smells a lot different when you're running a lot of blood through it. It's, it's pretty strong. And that odor hangs in there for many weeks. <laughs> it comes out the other end. So, other questions? Okay. Um, Joni? Yeah. This is from Mason. Um, you indicated that Eastern Washington farmers are, there's a high percentage that are using compost and it's a low percentage in Western Washington. Have you identified what the reasons are? Is it farm size? Is it the crops that are being grown? Is it cost? What is going on that there's such a huge differential? Thanks for asking that. That's a, that's a lot of what we're kind of working on right now. And we've got a couple of different theories on it. One is that in Eastern Washington, uh, they've been farming their land really tough, like really hard for a long time without many other organic inputs into it. We're kind of lucky over here that we do have all the dairy farms and have been able to put organic inputs into our fields for a long time. Um, and so generally we're finding that fields on this side of the Cascades have higher organic matter contents and just better nutrients overall. And so when they do apply compost, it's not having the same yield returns as it would on the eastern side of the mountains where they're totally desperate for any sort of organic matter. Um, and also field size is a big part of it. It's difficult to spread compost on these little itty bitty fields that are you going to sink in, you know, six months out of the year because it's too wet. Um, over there, they're big fields that are flat and dry and you can just lay out a whole bunch of compost and not really worry about it. Um, so those are a couple of the reasons that I think farmers over there are being able to purchase. All. And there's just more farmland. So. I've got a question, Jay. Okay. Many, I'm trying to, I used to say several, but now, uh, let me say, many years ago there was a an outfit, I believe they were down in the Kent area, that were manufacturing a drop box that, uh, that had uh, air tubes in it and an auger, and you would feed it from the top, and uh, by pumping air in it, it would speed up the... Uh, decomposition process. Has the county ever, or the conservation district ever dealt with anything like that and would that be uh, something to possibly apply for in the um, program where you contribute to? Do you want to take the first shot at that? Yeah, I can, I can take this question. Um, so as, as far as adding air to a, a compost system, um, there are several different options and a lot of new technologies, and we've seen several of these implemented. Um, it is it makes a, a large difference as far as speed of, of um, getting to a composted product. Um, so there is, a, you know, we've seen these auger type systems. There's a company called Green Mountain Technologies that does both an auger type system um, as well as a you know, a forced air system, you can even retrofit, um, you know, if you have an existing ecology block system, um, you know, obviously it's nicer if you have pipes in the ground, but there's always opportunity to retrofit. Um, O2 Compost is another local company that's doing these kind of aerated systems. If you are interested in an aerated compost system, the Conservation District does now through our cost share program. Um, well, in the past, we didn't fund mechanical movable systems. We are now funding those as part of a waste storage facility. So, um, so there is that option also um, through Equip. Um, there is that option as well. So, but but the same cap would apply, correct? Through Equip or or through, through your cost yes. program or the county cost. The same, yeah. So we would fund that under waste storage facility. Could also be if you had, you know, you could add a roof. That'd be something. So, so th those oh, types of practices generally cost a little more than just building a standard you know, ecology right. block bin. Um, so they, the same cap still applies, so you probably would pay, end up paying more out of pocket uh, because you know we, we would go up to the 75% cap by the $1,000 per animal unit if it was based on animal numbers. 
Um, so you, you might pay more out of pocket. But yes, the, our county cost share program has paid for some of those, uh, provided the reimbursement for those in the past, and the conservation district does as well. Okay. And so I do, Joe, want to The Green Mountain technology, it's a, it's a bin. Uh, I was trying to figure out some terminology that would be able to understand size, but if you take uh, two hot tubs, place one on top of the other one, that's about the size you're dealing with. And they have um, those uh, over on Bainbridge Island. We held a waste work conference in Seattle last year in late March and early April on one of the field trips. Went to um, Bainbridge Island. There's actually both of the major um, methods of composting that Green Mountains works with. And you can view both of those over on Bainbridge Island. Or uh, there may even be some stuff on our website. So if you get in touch with me, I can to that technology. The, the one I was thinking was large. It was about a 50 cubic yard Dropbox type of container that was built. Yeah, they have several different designs now. Um, Eric or Wayne? Yeah. A uh, question from Joe. Um, when you're talking about organic sources of nitrogen, you get about a, what was it, about a quarter of it carries over to the next year. Is that because the nitrogen? in the organic material is going to form the don't leach over the winter? Or how else is it? Because otherwise, don't you just use the nitrogen? Yeah, I don't know if everybody heard the question. Yeah. Sorry, could you repeat it? Yeah. So the question was, uh, the organic nitrogen, why why do you get some of that in the next year? Why is it just leached? And that's that's it. It's, a, it's organic nitrogen. So um, it's not in a nitrate form. It's not in ammonia form. And so it, it's not going to leach. It's going to stay there. It's more a part of the organic matter itself. So yeah, it's just more slowly broken down, and so then that next year you get a little bit more of it. Okay. And kind of a related question, one of the things I struggle with using organic, uh, like manure, as a source of nitrogen is that I get a lot more potassium than I want because I've already got lots of potassium, so how do you deal with that? Is the question is how to deal with potassium. That one's uh, probably our toughest challenge. Uh, it's not an environmental issue, per se, um, although there are a couple of places in the United States, I'm told, that have what are called karst soils, which are soils that have a lot of cracks in them, and then that can create some problems for um, groundwater. But um, in our area, we don't have any potassium-related water issues, um, but it does create an you know, issue for the cows. Um, potassium is really soluble, so it's, it's really difficult to capture it um, with any chemical technologies and, and, and so forth, so we, we just haven't come up with any good solution so the best is just minimize how much you got coming in um, you know certainly from a nutrition standpoint keep the high potassium porges away from those dry cows and you know, just kind of try to manage around it go ahead Eric yeah um, to any of you my question is somewhat similar to, to his but I'm thinking about the, the, the nutritional efficacy of compost um, the situation that, that we're in is we're in an active floodplain um, we can't run any room to store compost over a year for a spring application. So we end up um, applying it in August and then putting a cover crop on it. I wonder if there's just, have there been studies done that, that analyze the quality of the compost going in and seeing what happens to that? Does it leach out? Does it does it stay for a crop in the, in the spring? Well, the organic nitrogen is going to hang around unless it gets more stock. I mean, it's a floodplain and you have you know, high water coming. No, no, assuming it's incorporated with a cover crop yeah. growing in it. Yeah, so I, because a lot of your nitrogen in the compost is organic, it should be a fair amount of it around for that next year. And trace minerals as well? Uh, I, I can't speak to so much of the trace. I, I'm just not familiar with that part of it, but, but certainly the nitrogen. Okay. Now, Jay had a question? Well, on the same theme, well, I was curious as the, the fall soil test is capturing that kind of mobile nitrogen. Right. How is there a way to measure the stable nitrogen? You uh, just so you could kind of see, like, so, figure so out. I did that once, and what this is what I learned. So I'm trained as a nutritionist, right? So I know what nitrogen and protein are coming in front of the cow. So 15, 20 years ago, we got involved in some agronomic nutrient management kind of stuff. And so I said, well, let's look at the total nitrogen in the soil. And, um, you know, we're seeing these differences, and, and I, I tend to be kind of a quantitative biologist. I want to see how much, okay? 
you know, how much fuel is in the front of the cow and how much is in the milk bucket, right? So I said, well, we're going to do some total nitrogens on these soils. And what I found out was that we're trying to, to look at changes in the nitrate and ammonia levels of maybe 40 to 100 pounds per acre, right? All of a sudden, on, you know, on this soil, there was like eight to 10,000 pounds of total nitrogen, all right? So you can measure it, but your ability to measure that eight to 10,000 pounds per acre accurately and make any sense of the data is. Mm -hmm. So that's why we look at the forms that are really what the plant uses now and not look at the total amount of nitrogen. Well, I was just thinking if there's a way to anticipate, okay, if you're putting 20 yards, 100 yards per acre, or whatever the application is for yeah. your crop, and you know, well, half of it can be used this year, and somewhere in a third to a quarter is from that year one application is used in year two, but... Okay, so there is a spreadsheet that's available for Oregon State. Dan Sullivan, who used to work at the PL, worked with Andy Berry and Craig Carter, they developed a, a tool that Based on the manure analysis, I, I'm not sure. We've actually got a version of this. It's a, like a DMP guide, and it measures like uh, you take like a spring soil test, and you can see what the you know variable nutrients are in there. And then you have a nutrient analysis of your compost or of whatever manure, and then you take your plant and what the, you think the plant is going to need over that season at 100% growing. And then we've got a chart to figure out how much compost you should put down or how much manure you can put down, and that's available in the back. Mm -hmm. I can walk you through how to use it too. So the idea is plant available. Yes. So we have a question in the back there. Can you push that horse manure? Is it also considered organic? And then the second question is if it's dried like for a couple of years in turn, do you still have the same Okay, so you got this. So, um, so I'll stick my neck out and say that as a, I mean, if you don't have documentation that it's gone through a compost process and it's composted, technically, no. Um, I remember what I did as a kid, <laughs> and it worked really good. So you got the practical, and you got all these scientific and legal definition things. So. Yeah. Um, and I'm looking at Renee, <laughs> who's a horse person. <laughs> so, Constant. if you're trying to meet the organic certification and sell it as an organic, you know, amendment, you cannot do that unless you have all this documentation on. I turned it and it reached this temperature x number of times and all that stuff. But if you're composting it by doing the process. For your own use, you know, if you do it correctly, like Joe said, you have the right amount of feed stocks, the ratios, you have the temperatures, which is easily done by having at least three, four feet tall, then you can compost it and use it as that sort of product. Is that what you're asking, like the difference between the organic? Well, not necessarily. It depends on what okay. they're feeding the animals. Oh, I thought they said it was organic. Yeah, but it's not like the horses in that one. Uh, so we got another four game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, organic nitrogen, which means that um, there's going to be a carbon connected to the nitrogen. Okay. Right. Not so, organic, like uncertified yeah. organic. So inorganic would be nit uh, like uh, ammonia, so it's NH3, NH4, nitrates, NO2 or NO3. So you got, so it doesn't have any C. There's no carbon there. So in this con, in that context, organic really refers to the fact that you got carbon. So um, we are going to wrap this up right now so that we can have some lunch. Um, what I would ask is, is if you have additional questions, you, if you think that question would be, and the answer would be beneficial to everybody, if you could write it down so that we could get that answer out to everybody. But if not, you know, you can definitely grab one of these gentlemen um, on lunch break and, and ask your questions, please. So, I'll, yes. I'll be here until noon. And then That's I have right. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I have three more meetings with y'all this afternoon. So I'll be leaving at noon. So, but I'll stick around until then.
I will be leaving in a couple of minutes. Unfortunately, I have to be in downtown. So write your questions down if you so, have them. Or just grab them. Yeah. Snag them. Go ahead. You're welcome uh, to ride back to the city with me and we can talk. Let's, let's thank our speakers.